All right, uh, this lecture is on the statistical relevance account of scientific explanation. Um, it's due to uh, Salmon, so you should have either already or soon read that article. Um, and this, of course, um, you'll want to have already read or watched the um, lectures and readings on the deductive nomological account of scientific explanation, the objections to that account, and then also um, Hempel's deductive statistical and inductive statistical accounts of explanation. This is our fourth account, right? So Salmon, um, in general, we've seen some object objections to uh, deductive nomological account, but Salmon's also going to be arguing against the inductive uh, statistical and deductive statistical accounts uh, by Hempel. Um, and he's primarily going to be focused on the inductive statistical model, but he also is going to point out some problems with the other models we've seen. Um, and then Salmon's going to offer his own account, which will be called the statistical relevance account of scientific explanation. So um, first off, just to make clear what he's arguing against, he uh, recaps Hempel's conditions on what counts as explanation. First, um, the explanatory argument, right, the explanons, the premises and the argument, uh, they must have the correct sort of logical form. Um, so should be deductive or inductive, depending on the type of explanation. Um, and the premises should entail the conclusion in a deductive argument. Um, in the inductive argument, they should make the conclusion probable. Um, the premises of the argument must be true. We've covered this a few times, right? For Hempel, um, just being corroborated isn't good enough, right? We have to actually have a true theory. Um, three, uh, among the premises, there must be at least one uh, essential premise that is a law of nature, basically, a, what he calls here a law-like generalization. It might be universal for all x if fx and gx, or it might be a statistical generalization, right? Um, the probability of being an F given that you're a G is whatever, right? 0.5. Um, and then we have this um, final condition, which we saw um, in the last lecture on Hempel. We have, um, Hempel called it the requirement of maximal specificity. Um, Salmon's calling it the requirement of total evidence. Um, but again, the the point with that was we need all the relevant information, right? Or else we're going to come up with the wrong probabilities, right? So if I, um, our example was if you have a strep infection and you're given antibiotics, you have a high likelihood of recovering. Um, but if you don't tell me that the, uh, the strain of strep that you have is resistant to antibiotics, that's a whole different story, right? We need so we need all that extra relevant information in order to um, make a good explanation. So this is all stuff we covered, right? So he's just sort of repeating it. So then Salman, he's going to present a few counterexamples uh, to this account, right? So these, um, for the most part, will be examples that fulfill all those four conditions, and yet intuitively uh, we should look at these and say that's not a good explanation, right? So let's look at John Jones here over on the right. We can say um, John Jones is almost certain to recover from his cold within a week because he took vitamin C and almost all colds clear up within a week after administration of vitamin C. <clears throat> this satisfies the conditions. It is, uh, in this case, a deductive argument. Um, so this would be, I guess, deductive statistical since it's almost all um, premises are true. It does have a law like generalization, right? The, the law being almost all colds clear up within a week after administration of vitamin C. Um, and it doesn't leave out any information, right? It doesn't say that maybe he's got an especially strong cold or he's actually 105 years old or something like that. Um, this is still not a good explanation. Why? Um, the problem is that um, almost all colds clear up within a week, whether or not you take vitamin C. So his taking vitamin C doesn't explain why the cold cleared up. Um, try another one, right? So this is a deductive nomological explanation. Um, this sample of table salt dissolves in water, for it has had a dissolving spell cast on it, right? 
Um, and all samples of table salt that have had spells cast on them uh, dissolve in water. So <clears throat> that's true, right? Um, but it's not true in virtue of the spell, right? It's just true in the virtue of the nature of the spells. Um, so again, it seems to satisfy the conditions. Um, but, it, and again, there's no, like, it satisfies maximal specificity. There's nothing special about the salt that we should know about. Um, but nonetheless, bad explanation, right? Uh, and so on. Uh, John Jones avoided becoming pregnant during the past year, for he has taken his wife's birth control pills regularly, and every man who regularly takes birth control pills avoids pregnancy. Again, two premises, right? Um, deductive relationship, it's a valid argument. Um, there's nothing else special about John Jones we need to know that was left out. And yet, um, obviously a bad explanation, right? It's not the birth control pill. He's a man, right? Um, doesn't have ovaries. That's the real explanation for why he's not pregnant. So um, we need something different, right? To we need we want to make it so that these don't count as good scientific explanations. And it appears, at least according to Salmon, that Temple's conditions don't rule these out. We need to do a little better. Again. Um, just fleshing it out, right? So <clears throat> walking you through Salmon's uh, article, each of the examples constitutes an argument, shows that the explanandum event, right? The thing that we're explaining uh, was to be expected. That's requirement one. Um, there is correct deductive or inductive logical form, also requirement one. Uh, each one has true premises sort of by assumption, right? These aren't actual cases. But, um, uh, and each one has a law among its premises, right? Requirement three. Um, now you might say, well, are those really laws, right? Is It's not, I don't know of any scientific theory that says that all um, samples of salt that have had a spell cast on them will dissolve. Um, and Salmon's reply to that objection is, well, they, they're certainly not accidental generalizations. They're very general claims, right? And they're true. So, um, Hempel doesn't really give a great uh, account of what counts as a law, right? Um, basically just says they shouldn't be accidental generalizations. And they should be general, right? So it can't be something like everyone in this room is shorter than six foot four, therefore I'm shorter than six foot four. Um, so uh, they do seem to satisfy Hempel's conditions on laws, although you might think that those conditions aren't very good. Right? Um, in each case, the law is essential to the argument, right? Um, if you took it out, it would no longer be a valid argument, or in the inductive case, it would no longer um, confer probability on the conclusion. Um, and uh, in each of these examples, we're assuming that the requirement of total evidence is fulfilled. Um, in the deductive arguments, it's not even an issue, right? That's only an issue for the inductive explanation. We saw that in the last lecture. Um, and in the inductive examples, um, sort of we're assuming, we're just sort of stipulating that there's nothing extra we need to know, right? Just a normal cold that John Jones has, um, right? And a uh, man who didn't get pregnant, um, there's nothing else sort of relevant, right? So, according to Salmon, there's nothing about any of these examples, so far as I can see, which would disqualify them in terms of the foregoing criteria without also disqualifying Hempel's examples as well. So these should satisfy, these should be good explanations according to Hempel. And clearly they're not. Um, and so this is not, again, right, Hempel did have this issue of maximum specificity. So I want to make clear that um, the problems we're running into here are not the same problems that he supposedly solved. Um, so the problem for Hempel with inductive explanation that he solved with the requirement of maximal specificity was that without all the, if you don't have all the information, you might get to the wrong conclusion, right? But here the problem is that we have all the information, just that um, we, we're using uh, information that's irrelevant, right? And laws that are irrelevant to the actual explanation. Um, so fundamental flaw here, right? Is not just that uh, the explanations um, lead you, so the explanation leads you to expect the conclusion. Um, the problem is that what we need is something that will increase the probability of the conclusion over its prior probability, right? So like in the case of me taking birth control pills, 
it didn't make it any more likely that I would would fail to become pregnant. Uh, so this is the issue that uh, Salmon that does seems to be um, not addressed by Humble Account. And <clears throat> Salmon actually thinks that the whole issue of um, framing explanation as an argument is actually it's kind of at the core of this problem and it seems to be misguided, right? So um, Salmon points out that probability theory, right, uh, traditionally conceived doesn't even have modus ponens, right? You can, um, uh, we can talk about hypotheses and there's being supported by evidence and the probability of a certain outcome uh, without doing deductive or inductive arguments at all. That's just not really how uh, probability theory works. Um, so, as Salman conceives it, right, based on uh, probability theory, uh, an explanation involves adding new evidence to a total body of evidence that will then increase the probability of the outcome. Um, so importantly, if you want to um, tackle explanation from this angle, right, which is a, a kind of a radically different angle, we're not talking about explanations as arguments anymore, um, then we do need to make more clear this notion of what our total body of evidence is. Um, and importantly, that total body of evidence can't contain either the explanandum or the explanons, because what we want to do is compare the probability before and after, right? We, we add the explanation, and then um, we want to see if the probability of the explanandum is increased when we add the explanon. So in order to sort of like formalize this, um, now, so we're going to get a little, um, this is going to get a little sort of like, uh, uh, not technical, but right, we're going to use, we're introduce some terminology. Um, so again, just to be clear, the big picture idea is for Salman, let's not look at explanation as an argument. Let's look at as um, probability theory and a good explanation is the one that makes the explanandum, the thing, the prediction or whatever, more likely, right? So that's the big picture. So now let's get into the details of how you could formalize such an account. Right? Um, we need to uh, talk about reference class. This is the first sort of bit of terminology and the statistical re relevance of a reference class. And in order to understand that, you also need to understand the notion of an attribute. So say you've got um, a couple of my videos over the uh, um, second ones, but say we've got a couple urns, right? And one is full of uh, balls. Can I move? I can't move it. Uh, one's got a few different colored balls, right? And the other one's got all red balls. So the one that's covered up, all the balls are red. Right? And I'll post these slides. So, um, we're curious about what's the probability that we'll draw a red ball, right? Um, so the drawing of the ball is the reference class, the event, right, the sample. And then redness is the attribute class. So that is um, the thing we're curious about, right? Is the event going to be a red ball drawing event or another? Um, okay. So we could change the reference class by talking about which urn we pull the ball from, right? Maybe we're drawing a ball from an urn filled entirely with red balls, right? That wouldn't change the attribute class. We're still curious in whether we'll draw a red ball. Um, but if you're drawing from, right, but if the event is in that different reference class, that's gonna change the probability, right? Um, the probability of drawing a red ball will go from, what is that, two in five to 100%. Uh, okay. So then, My uh, my screen went to sleep for a little bit, so I just wanted to make sure that I was still recording. Um, a reference class can be more or less narrow, right? Um, so imagine a, a girl called Mina, right? A woman. Um, we can talk about her as a member of various different reference classes. Maybe we'll uh, we want to treat Mina as a human, right? That's one reference class. Um, maybe we want to talk about her as a human female, uh, another reference class. Maybe human American females or even narrower, human American females with brown eyes, right? So you belong to an infinite number of reference classes. Um, 
and any event really uh, could belong to an infinite number of reference classes um, from very broad to very narrow, right, depending on how you want to describe it. So in this case, um, our sort of subsequent reference classes uh, that we used to talk about MENA got more and more narrow. Um, and suppose the attribute class, right, the, the property that we're wondering is what we get when we sort of uh, talk about MENA, say it lives to be 80 years old, right? Okay, well then, um, depending on the reference class we used to describe MENA, um, the probability will change, right? So um, if you say she's a human, Okay, you have one probability. If you say she's a human female, the probability of her living to 80 will go up, right? Because um, women tend to live longer. Um, human American female probably will go up on average. Uh, life expectancy, I think, is higher in, Amer in the U.S. than in the world on average. Could be wrong about that. Um, human American females with brown eyes, not going to change, right? To my knowledge, there's no brown eyes don't live any longer or less long uh, than people. Again, as you change the reference class that you're using to describe the same event, example, um, probabilities can go up and down. Okay. So another example, right? So we have an object or an event, and we want to figure out the probability that it has attribute B. So first, we need to assign it a reference class A, right? Because probabilities can change depending on the reference class. So let's say PAB is the probability um, of attribute in that reference class, right? And here, is, here we have a comma, and Salman's use of the comma is going to be different than, um, uh, is it? Well, no. Anyways, um, okay. So, so let's call B getting cancer, right? And A being an American female. So we want to know what's the probability of getting an American female getting cancer? Um, okay, uh, this a set of mutually exclusive and exhaustive subclasses of a class is a partition of that class. So any so American females, we can partition it out in any way we want um, by hair color, right? Um, and we're going to assume that that's um, exclusive and exhaustive. So there's nobody that's going to have like both brown and blonde hair or something like that. So it's going to split everybody up into group. Everybody's going to be in a group. There's going to be a distinct group for everybody, right? A partition. Um, so we might want to partition A into two subclasses, right? Um, call it AC and A, A dot C and A dot not C. Um, well, let's call C uh, whether you smoke or not, right? So you would have um, A dot C would be American female smokers and A dot not C American female non-smokers, right? So we have partitioned our initial reference class into two exclusive exhaustive sub right all the american women fit in one of those two and they only fit in one of the other so the property um, is statistically relevant to an attribute in a reference class an attribute b within a reference class a only if the property of a dot c so a um, partitioned from c uh, does not equal the probability of A comma B. So A not partitioned, right? Not in the narrower reference class. So again, supposing B is has lung cancer, um, then C would smoking would be statistically relevant, right? So the probability of A point C comma B would be greater than the probability of P A comma B, right? So if you're American female smokes, more likely to get cancer than if you're American female. Um, but suppose B is owns a Chevrolet, right? Um, in that case, then smoking is not going to be statistically relevant. The probability that you want a Chevrolet is not going to change whether you smoke or whether you don't. Um, so that's the concept of statistical relevance. Um, is a partition on a class a certain property on a certain property is that statistically relevant? Um, it's just statistically relevant if and only if right it changes the probability uh, of the attribute. Okay, uh, one more concept here, a homogeneous reference class. Uh, now this is one where there's no further partition that would make any statistic relevance, statistically relevant difference to a given attribute. So I take American females 
Um, and again, the attribute is, well, they get cancer and we partition it among every, so we partition smokers, right? But then we also partition um, family history and we partition uh, whether you are a coal miner or not. We find every like partition that could possibly be relevant to whether you get cancer. Um, and if you've done all that, then you have a homogenous reference. Right? There's no further breaking up that you could make that would make any difference to the probabilities. At this point, um, basically, uh, you have a class that's totally random, right? Any member um, is going to be as likely as any other to have the attribute within a given partition, right? Um, so Salmon says that when giving a reference class in our explanation, what makes a good explanation, right, is the one that chooses the broadest homogeneous reference class to which event or object belongs. So it calls this the reference class. Um, this way, right, we'll catch all of the relevant factors, um, like whether an infection is antibiotic resistant, but we're going to ignore all the non-relevant factors, like whether a man took birth control, right? So um, it wouldn't be homogenous if we ignored whether the infection was antibiotic resistant, right? Um, but it wouldn't be the broadest one if we included a factor like whether you take birth we want the broadest homogenous one. It catches all the statistically relevant factors and yet and ignores all the non-relevant ones. Now, of course, um, you can never know for sure whether your reference class is totally homogenous, right? There may be some causal factor that you missed. Um, this is just, you know, we're going to be limited by the state of our knowledge at that time. Uh, for all we know, uh, right, certainly, um, just partitioning, right, American females into smokers and non-smokers would not catch all of them, and you could keep going. So maybe working in a coal mine is relevant. Maybe living in New York City would be relevant, right? Um, but there's always another possible causal factor that you missed, right? But you just do your best. Um, all we can do. So, uh, whenever we can partition based on some statistically relevant property, we can do so, so as to create homogeneous reference. Now, if you, we've sort of encountered this issue before talking about statistical laws and stuff, you're like sort of a strict determinist where you think basically there aren't any really any statistical laws and that every, if you knew everything, you would be able to predict with certainty every account, every outcome in the universe. Um, if that's your sort of metaphysical view of uh, the nature of sort of laws, um, then you might think that there is always some statistically relevant partition and then in principle you could keep going and you could always have a homogenous class in which all the A's are B's. It captures all of the American female who who get um, I think yeah, American male here, but female, right? Um, so again, this is like a metaphysical question that it's not clear that we can sort of answer right away or even ever. Um, but anyways, Salman denies it, right? And and our best account, I think I mentioned before of the behavior of subatomic particles, quantum mechanics does seem to think that there's just determinism at the bottom, right? that there's something about particles that um, until they're observed, they aren't in any determinist state. Okay, so <laughs> zooming out. So given these concepts, here's how explanation works for some. So suppose we're trying to explain why a substance dissolves in water. A broad reference class of substances that included rocks, rocks table salt, um, would not be homogeneous. Um, the probability uh, that a rock dissolves in water is going to be much different than the probability that table salt dissolves in water. Um, so we can partition that up, right, based on whether the substance is table salt. Um, so we'd have, in this case, two partitions, salt, non-table salt, non-salt. Um, and the resulting homogeneous reference class of things, objects that are table salt, would certainly increase the probability that an object drawn from that class dissolved in water. Um, so is this the broadest class, right, um, that uh, that would change the probability? Well, we could keep dividing it, right? Um, you could divide it in where it came from, um, divide it on whether it's been, uh, had a spell cast on it, right? Uh, it turns out that is not going to change the probability. So 
That means that being table salt is statistically relevant to dissolving in water and should factor in our explanation of why this object dissolves in water. And um, being hexed does not, right? That is not statistically relevant. And so that should not factor in our explanation of why um, something dissolves in water. Um, remember the symmetry problem, right? This is the flagpole, right? And uh, we said, okay, well, we can explain the shadow, the length of the shadow of the flagpole, right? In terms of the um, position of the sun and the height of the flagpole. Um, but it turned out that mathematically you could also um, explain the height of the flagpole from the length of the shadow and the position of the sun. And that seemed weird, right? Because it kind of doesn't cause the flagpole. And, and that was a conjecture that deduct, when we were talking about the deductive neurological account of explanation, um, like it left out certain notions of causation that you think should be important for explanation. Um, so Salman is not talking uh, about causation either, right? So does the same problem pop up for Salman in a statistical relevance account? And he thinks it doesn't, right? Um, he thinks he can solve the symmetry problem with his account. Um, so his example is the correlation you get between uh, barometer readings. Um, those have got a little barometer up there and, uh, and, and storm, right? So barometers measure sort of atmospheric pressure and there is a relationship between atmospheric pressure and whether you're gonna get a thunderstorm. Um, so it certainly correlates with it, right? But you wouldn't want to say that the uh, barometer causes the storm, right? Um, rather, it's the atmospheric pressure that both causes the changes in the barometer and changes um, and, and causes the storm. Um, so can Salman's account rule out an explanation that it was the change in the barometer that caused the storm? That's the bad explanation. We don't want that. Um, but there does appear to be a statistical relevance, right? Um, so Salman says that actually on his account, right, the reference class of barometer readings is going to turn out to be less statistically relevant than the reference, reference class of atmospheric pressure. Why? Because the reference class of barometer readings is going to also include faulty readings. Right, malfunctioning barometers, readings in a house that's like perfect, totally sealed off from the uh, surrounding atmosphere, uh, readings where I'm trying to prank you or something and I've messed with it. So, um, due due to the fact, right, that like the causal relationship can be broken in various ways, and 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 those cases are going to be involved in the um, statistics in in the probabilities. Uh, then in that case, you're going to come out with higher statistical relevance for atmospheric pressure or for barometers. Okay, and that is our last slide. So uh, this is our last lecture on uh, scientific explanation. If you read the Stanford Encyclopedia article, which I believe was a uh, in one of the required readings. Um, I wasn't crazy about uh, account of this, and I thought that the Stanford Encyclopedia article was a better sort of so if you keep going, you'll see there's even more accounts of scientific explanation. There's ones that focus uh, on causation, right? Um, there's some stuff by Nancy Cartwright, who's in our own department, who's a really great philosopher of science. And if you are interested in this stuff and interested in reading her articles, she's someone that's around and you can like talk to her and stuff and read your papers, and give feedback. So, um, a lot more to be said about this stuff. Looking forward to discussing it with you. But that is it for the lectures on or do on this subject.